this morning with us? How's everybody in the house doing? Well? Well? Come on, we want to welcome you this morning to Sunday service. All those that are with us online, we welcome you. I'm so excited to be in the house of God on behalf of our beautiful senior pastors, Pastor Daryl and Miss Catherine. We welcome you to this house. We're excited to have you. We're excited to worship with you today. Amen. Amen. Just like Krista said, we're so excited to have you all in the house with us this morning. I want to address the live stream nation. Live stream nation, you hold a very vital part in this service. So one, for one, I want you to start off by liking it. Give it like 10 hearts. <laughs> and then once you're done with that, go ahead and press that share button. You have at least maybe 100 friends. I see some of y'all that have like thousands. I don't know how. I only have like five friends. Um, so just go ahead and share that. Like give it a share. Say best church in Corpus Christi. I'm just kidding. Um, but go ahead and share that because like I said, you reach such a, um, a part of the community that sometimes we can't reach. And I want to go ahead and um, read the scripture. It's from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, Jesus came to them and said, All have authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will always, I will, I am always with you to the very end of age. And I want to do something different. I want to go ahead and I want y'all to repeat after me. Say, I am chosen. I have a purpose, and I am loved. And if you realize you did something different, or you were doing something while you were saying all of that, you were breathing. And if you are breathing, you have a purpose. You are called to make a difference. You are called to set people free. You are called to do miracles. I just speak um, blessings over y'all, and I'm ready to go ahead and get into the service. I hope y'all are. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we give you this service, Jesus. We thank you for miracles, signs, and wonders. I just thank you, God, that we, we step into it, Lord, and we give you everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, you ready to worship this morning? Are you ready to worship this morning? Come on, church.
morning. He's worthy. Father, we bless your name. Just take a minute. Just lift your hands all over the house. Well, let's set an atmosphere this morning for miracles. I don't know about you, but I came this morning believing for miracles, signs, wonders, healing, deliverance, captives set free, the brokenhearted healed lives brought into the kingdom of God this morning. And Father, we thank you that your word declares that you who promised is faithful. Father, that you will complete and accomplish everything that you set out to accomplish. And this morning, Father, every burden, Father, that we may be carrying, Father God, we just, we appropriate your word that says casting all of our care upon him because he cares for us. There's nothing you're not feeling or sensing right now that he's not feeling and sensing with you. There's nothing that you're walking through right now that he's not walking through with you. He's right there in the midst of the water, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of everything that you're facing right now. And he is the God of breakthrough. He is the God that will bring you out. But the question is, is are you willing to give to him what you're holding on to? It's not yours, it doesn't belong to you. Good or bad, it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to him. So Father, this morning, as this song says, we're not going to wait for the walls to fall. Father, we're going to enter in into your throne room. Because it's at that name, the name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And we declare you as Lord right now in this house, in this place, in this hour, in every life, Lord God. And Father, we submit to you completely and totally. Take full control of this service. We give it all to you right now. Move on us. Breathe on us. As we pour our hearts out to you this morning. I feel it in my bones, you're about to move. I feel it in the wind, you're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So
spoke a word you were singing on to me you had been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you had been so so
shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me me There's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up
Oh, wait. 
fun that is when those songs pop up, man. We got to sing them. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. We're singing a new one. Hallelujah. Let's enter in together. Hallelujah. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. Precious Lord Jesus, treasure of mine. Mm. Oh, what a privilege to be your delight. Morning by morning.
How great you are, God. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. of Jesus. It's his love. That's all I've been hearing in my spirit is love, love, love. It's the goodness of God that brings man to repentance. You feel that tug in your heart. He gives a comfort, a comfort that cannot be attained on this earth. See, we can receive comfort from our spouse. We can receive comfort from our children. We can receive comfort from your mother or your father. But it gets to a point to where they give all of what they have within capacity, but it just, God's love surpasses that. It's, uh, it's incomprehensible. It's a love that is not attainable by works and by goodness. He loves you at your rawness. He loved you at your darkest. You don't have to do anything to earn it. He freely gave it to you. And I and and I I see that this this world is 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 hungry, hungry for something that is gonna fulfill whatever it is that is hindering you, and it's his love. It's his love. That's what brings security. That's what brings comfort. That's what brings joy. When things are going haywire all around you, you can still cling to his promises and sit in his presence and be comforted in the midst of the battle. All these wars may be happening around you, whether it be in your mind, whether it be in your home, whether it be at your workplace, but if you just take a moment and sit in his comfort, in his presence, nothing else matters. Everything falls by the wayside because you feel this love and this joy and this comfort that is greater, knowing that whatever it is that's going around you doesn't matter, it's him, it's his love. And I just wanna encourage you all, This. it? Press beyond the boundary of of uncomfortableness. Press beyond the boundary of trying to go back to the things that were um, fulfilling to your flesh for that moment. Because his love is what brings the comfort. His love is eternal. It doesn't run out and it never gets old. It's always something new. His love. His love. That's what it is. So as we move on from this worship where you were able to freely give yourself. We move on to our tithes and that's our worship area. But we also have 
the word that is going to be coming in. And as you sit there and you've already opened your heart, leave it open and let Holy Spirit come in and speak to your heart, guiding you with every truth and every word that is spoken this morning. Each and every time you seek him, he's going to continue to change you and mold you into his likeness. So that's what I wanted to encourage with you all this morning. If you want to give God glory, give the praise and worship team a round of applause. just want to bring a few announcements to you. Um, so we have um, a few things coming up, some great things. Um, the first thing that we have is uh, a men's group. Get excited, men. I want to hear you shout. We got a men's group coming up. And it's going to be called Valor. So we have this coming up for our men. And um, this is going to be, um, sorry, guys, one moment. I wanted to make sure that I give the right date and time. And I, didn't for I forgot. So my apologies. Valor, strong men, strong church, okay? So it's a Cornerstone Men's Fellowship. It's going to be Saturday, February 6th from 5 to 7. If you are interested, please do sign up at the Information Center. Um, we want to get a head count to see who all will be atta uh, attending. So it would be greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated if you all um, strong men can go and sign up to receive the word of God that night. It's going to be an awesome time. We also have another great announcement, and that is Mary Frances Varallo is going to be coming again. So that's going to be awesome. If you have not been, I strongly encourage you to come and attend and see how she flows. She has such a strong anointing and just flows in the Holy Spirit. And it's so encouraging to see how um, she is obedient to the word of God and how she moves freely with him, with his direction. So that's going to be Sunday, February 21st from at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. There will not be any live stream available. So those that, are, that attend live stream, we strongly encourage for you to come and attend in person. Of course, we want to remind you that we do follow guidelines. So please um, do come if you are interested in attending. Again, no live stream on that day. And I want to give... A moment to welcome our first time guests. If it is your first time here, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand and everyone, if you can give them a round of applause. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Greatly appreciated that you all attended. It's so wonderful to see new faces. Um, I believe there will be a, yes, the ushers will be bringing you just a welcome card, a little bit in, of welcome information for you here at Cornerstone Church. And now I'm going to pass it on over to Pastor Elder Price. Sorry. <laughs> I saw you standing there. Give him a round of applause. Good morning. Gentlemen, if you would come prepare for the offerings. You know, in 2 Samuel 24, the, the Bible tells us that there was a pestilence in the land. And, you know, if you, you, trans, you move that 2,550 years forward, I'd like to say there was a pandemic in the land. And Prophet Gad went to David and said, you need to go to Aruna and purchase a threshing floor from him. Now, a threshing floor is a place where they bring the wheat and they're able to trot it down and separate the wheat from the chaff, the good from the bad, the waste from the first fruit, so to speak. So David, you all know the story, David went to Aruna, the Jebusite, and he said, God spoke to me and I need to purchase animals and I need to, to purchase your threshing floor. Runa being a good servant, 
bowed down before the king and said, this is all yours. Take what you want. And David stopped him and said, no, I will take nothing from you that cost me nothing, but I will pay the full price. And it said that David bought the land and the sacrifice and built an altar for the Lord on that site, that site that is meant to cleanse and separate the good from the bad. And it said that when David made the offering before God, that the pestilence was removed from the land. And so what does that tell us? Well, first of all, we don't, as you know, we don't have to worry about making the sacrifice, that portion, because the spotless, blemishless lamb was sacrificed on our behalf to remove the pestilence or pandemic. Can you say amen? But what else that tells us is that David's heart was, I will give nothing to God that cost me nothing. There had to be sacrifice. There had to be a payment. There had to be something to create value to David. In other words, he's not just going to take things for granted and just take advantage of the situation and just get something for nothing. You know, it's so hard and so easy in some respects for us in life to take things for granted. Sometimes we get something for nothing because of the benefit of someone else and nothing that we did. But what that tells me is that David understood that an offering, whether it was an animal or it was financial or it was first fruits of the ground, the grain or the fruit, that there had to be something of value to connect his heart with what he gave to God. There has to be substance there. So what that tells me that as we worship God, we thank God the sacrifice has been paid in blood. Amen. And let me tell you, aren't you glad that you guys didn't have to stop by the stockyard in Robstown and pick up a goat or a lamb or an ox or a bull or a turtle dove and bring it to the altar of God this morning and watch a bloody sacrifice? Aren't you glad you don't have to do that anymore? But at the same time, when you do come before the Lord, the altar, the threshing floor, this place that's meant to be holy, and you give your offering, it represents something. And that's why before we give, we stop for a minute and we reflect. Now, if you work a job, a 40-hour week job, some of you work 50, some of you may not have work right now, but that's temporary, okay? That's temporary. Before you give, you have the obligation to stop and reflect, God gave me this. I earn this, but only because he gave me the ability to earn this. It's only because God gave me this job. This is the least I can do. So we call that reflection. And so before you give, it's always important that you just don't rush and just give and go back to your seat. Or if you're giving online, you just do it kind of casually. That This is a moment of worship. You're coming to God at the threshing floor, at the altar. And so it's not just that we set plastic buckets up here on a wood rail that's on a concrete and wood platform. Because this represents the threshing floor, the altar, the place of worship. And you know, if you know, many of you end up sometimes, sometimes praying on your knees or in your face before God, because this this is the altar. So that's what we need to think about. We reflect on that when we give. We reflect on the fact that we're coming before the presence of God, His altar, and we're thanking Him for removing the pestilence. We're thanking him that he gives us the substance and the, and the things we're able to give. And that's, that's why it's important that when we ask that you participate, that you remember, first and foremost, it's not you giving, writing a check, 
it's your heart, your worship. You're taking time to reflect that payment, the fact that we don't have to offer blood sacrifices, that we're fortunate enough that we just give financial, which is easy. Sometimes you just write a check or punch in a credit card. And if you're giving online, we've, we've made it easy for you too. But in, and for those that are home and those that are watching by various means of streaming or um, YouTube or perhaps Facebook, we just encourage you that when we pray, and we're going to pray in a moment, and I want you to take what you have at home and I want you to hold it up because it represents your offering, your sacrifice, that which you're putting before the altar of God. And even if you're giving online, put your hand on your heart or your wallet or, or something that's symbolic that's your connection of what you're giving because you're, it's a tangible thing that we give and we place before the altar of God. So with that said, let's come forward and let's give to the Lord in this moment and then we'll pray. And then when you come back and you sit down, we'll pray. And I want you to think about those things I said. Hallelujah, if you would come on forward and share your offering. Oh, first, if you need an offering envelope, please raise your hand. I think we're good, guys. Thanks. you guys to bring them right up here and we're going to hold them up like we're, we're, we're holding an offering before God and I want you to stretch your hands forth if you're watching at home live stream or, or recorded message the same thing it doesn't matter time or space there's no such concept in the spiritual world father we lift these offerings before you father they represent the sacrifice of the people Father, they represent part of the our job, our responsibility, our duty as part of the covenant. Father, it's a covenant that you drew up for our benefit. We didn't come up with it. We didn't propose it. We didn't sit around with a bunch of lawyers and bankers and come up with it. You did. You said that if we would give, that you would bless the households of those that give. And Father, the Bible says if we worship God, that you would stop and still the avenger. And Father, we thank you that as we give forth that the pestilence is removed from the land in our homes. And Father, I thank you that we worship you and the altar is such a privilege to be able to worship you and to participate in something that's pure grace that we had nothing to do with, but we reap the benefit of. And Father, we thank you and we praise you and we love you and we say this in the name of your son, Jesus, and all those in agreement said, Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 God is good. Amen. God is really good. You know, I'm excited about what's coming this year. I can tell you this. In my heart, I have no doubt in my mind that we're going to see salvations that are unprecedented. It doesn't matter if it's in India, if it's going to be in Japan, it's going to be in China, or it's going to be in Robstown. We're going to see more salvations in 2021 than all the rest of us. And I, with that being said, I just want to take an opportunity, if you would, let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Arnold this morning as he comes to deliver that word. Amen. Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody blessed in the house of God? 
Amen. How many are excited for the word this morning? How many are excited for the word this morning? Come on. We're going to do something. Pastor Robbie got me feeling some kind of way when he started singing them old songs. So uh, I want you to do something with me. You're going to stand with me. If you got your Bibles, stand with me and hold up your Bibles. We are going to do... We're going to honor our pastor, and we're going to do the confession of faith. Come on. I told them to put it up because I forgot half of it, so they need to put it up there. Come on. All right. Whenever you're ready, media team, you're going to repeat after me. I'm still looking at myself. Okay, hold on. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do because I am a doer of this word. And not just a hearer only. This word is alive, sharper than a two-edged sword, working in the realm of the Spirit on my behalf to bring all the promises of God. Say that again, to bring all the promises of God to yes and amen in my life. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Oh, I remembered that. Oh, I thought I was going to forget it. I remembered it. Amen. It's well, so good to be in the house of God this morning. I'm excited about what God is doing. Thank you for your enthusiasm, Pastor Gene. It is so good to be in the house of God this morning. Come on. If you were here last week, we had a, a tremendous message, not because of who preached it, but because God spoke. And Somebody, a couple of people said, man, I know you're not done with that message. I know you're not done with that message. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, I was finished. <laughs> it was done. <laughs> and they're like, no, nah, I know you got more. And I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, amen, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have nothing else. <laughs> but then as I went back and I started rereading it, I said, well, I guess I wasn't done. That was prophetic right there. So how are you all ready for the word this morning? Let's pray, and we'll get right into it. Let's pray. Bow your heads with me, and let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this important day that we have uh, that represents the, your day, Father, the Lord's day, Sunday, that we could come into your house, God, that we can honor you, that we can worship you, that we can bring sacrifices of praise to you, that we can bring what we have to you in the form of money, that we can bring our voices, our lives, our substance to you, Father. We thank you, God, that you accept it, Father, as a sweet-smelling aroma into your nostrils. We thank you that you live in the praises of your people, Father, and so therefore we know that praise has already gone out, and we know that you are here, Father, so we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Holy Spirit. I say let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Luke, and we are going to go on for, forward in this message that he entitled The Impregnation, and we're going to come up with the even loftier message, and we are going to call it The Impregnation 2. Amen. Come on. Come on. You can laugh, guys. You can laugh. <laughs> Be free in Jesus' name. Laugh about it. Amen. Impregnation Part 2. The way that the Lord brought about the message last week, it was more in the form of what he has deposited inside of you and what he has given inside of you. And for some of y'all, it was dreams, aspirations, and callings. And for some of you, it was uh, just thoughts and, and visions that he had given to you that you really never spoke anything about to anybody. And so he placed something inside of you. If you were not here last Sunday, I encourage you to go back and watch what uh, the message was about. And it was about Mary. And it was, it was given to me during Christmas time. And, and I was wondering why I didn't share it. And the Lord brought forth. And it was almost like a prophetic word about what God was going to do with a lot of people in his church this year. And that it was going to come to pass. The things that God has birthed inside of you and impregnated you was going to come to pass this year. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So you need to hold on to that word. But he showed me a little differently this time as I read it. So go with me to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to go over a little bit but expound on what Mary represents. How many of you know that Mary was the, the, the chosen one, was the one who the Lord chose to carry himself? Amen. <laughs> 
right? He said, I am going to marry. I'm going to pick you, choose you. You're favored. I got something planned for you. I'm going to deposit something inside of you, which is Jesus, and you're going to be favored among everybody else, and you're going to birth this man, this baby Christ, and he's going to change the world, right? So we find that in in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 56, And I don't think I did an injustice to the word of God, but I did portray it as to be a dream and a vision or what he has given a calling. But I want to hone in the fact that Mary does simply represent the believer, the believer of God, the one who doesn't really know God and yet God sees them. And the one who is going on about life and yet God chooses that person to make himself known. You see, so Mary is none other than a believer. When you say Mary was the mother of God, yes, but she represents you. She represents me. She represents somebody just going along with their plans and not really thinking about God, and yet God intervenes in her plans. Remember, Mary was betrothed to be with Joseph. That means she was engaged, and God gets in the midst of the plan. You might have had plans to do something else. You might have not even even seen yourself inside a church, yet God got in the midst of your life and your plans. And now you see you are in a building called a church. You see, Mary is you. Mary is you. And when God decides to get in the midst of you, he impregnates Mary with Jesus. Well, he impregnates you with Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit. You see, so he says, Mary, I'm going to do something in you. And she says, how can this be, seeing I do not know a man? You see, many of you come and say, well, you know, I'm just coming to church. And God says, no, I want to, remember the word pregnate means to permeate and to saturate one from the inside out. And he says, I will impregnate you, Mary, inside your womb. From the inside out, I will put myself in you. I will put my spirit in you. Well, who am I? That was Mary's response. Who am I? And the Bible begins to talk about how favored she is. How just, how special she really is. You see, you can be confused because how can God say that about you? And you say, well, I didn't choose him. No, he chose you just like he chose Mary, which is why it is so fitting that she is the believer. Nobody in here chose God before God chose them. He called you even when you didn't even know that you were having an inkling of, of, you know, when I was born again, when I got born again, I was going in the seventh grade, but I distinctly remember in the fifth grade when the teacher wrote on the whiteboard, Merry Christmas. It was the very first time that I ever noticed the word Christ in there. The very first time I was in fifth grade. And I said, what has that got to do with Christmas? I didn't know what Christmas was about in fifth grade. I didn't know. Little did I know that he was calling me and choosing me to come to him at that very moment. And I would get saved a year and a half later. Why? Because he chose me. And there are a lot of people in here right now that God has chosen you. Well, how can this be? Because there's something about you. There's something that you have that he longs for. There's something that he wants, and that is a relationship with you. That is a friendship with you. That is, a, that is, that is something that is not just uh, kindled on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, but that is an everyday thing and process of your life that he longs and desires to be with you. He says, I'm going to impregnate you, Mary. I'm going to permeate and saturate you with my spirit. And he's telling y'all that today. 
that he wants to permeate and saturate you with his spirit. Deep down, it goes beyond your mind. It goes beyond what you do and the physical and the natural. But deep down inside of you, the womb representing the very heart of who you are. He wants to do that. And I just thought, my God, that's so amazing. Will you say, I don't believe that he chose you or that he chooses me. You know what, God, you know, I chose him. I have to make the decision. We'll go to John 15, 16. I'm so glad you said that because he says no. John 15, 16. I encourage you to take notes today. John 15, 16, he says, no, you didn't choose me. I have chose you and I have appointed you. Or ordains you, depending on the translation, that you should bear fruit. Well, what does that mean, bear fruit? Well, what do they do when they're having children? They bear children. Mary, you are going to go forth and you are going to bear a son from me. And he says, I have chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you so that you can bear fruit. The very thing that he has impregnated and implanted in you, his spirit, he wants to bear that inside of you, not because of you, but because of him. And if you can get that in your mind, that it has nothing to do with you whatsoever, it all has to do with him. To you, you might not be that special, but to him, you are. To you, you might not seem yourself worthy, but to him, he is. There you are. You're worthy because he's worthy. And you got to get that in your mind. Mary, I chose you. You don't really believe me? Okay, go to Ephesians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. And he says this to the church in Ephesus. The Bible says that he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Go ahead and read the rest of that scripture on your own time. He says that so that we can be blameless above reproach and holy. He chose you before the foundations of the world. The very creation account of him built, uh, creating and forming Adam from the dirt. And breathing his breath into him to give him a spirit, he put himself into Adam and that got broken. So he had to put himself into Mary to replace what was broken in Adam. Doesn't this goat man, it makes so much sense, right? When I read it, I said, oh, my Lord. I said, this is me. Well, that's a female version. doesn't matter. This is a representation of you that he wants to deposit himself back in you. For a purpose. He says, what I'm going to put in you, you shall call him Jesus, which is Joshua, which is God is salvation. If that doesn't get any more clear that he's talking about a new believer that I'm going to put myself into you and it's going to be God is salvation. Jesus, my spirit, you are going to walk around and saying, God, you're my salvation. Despite what I think of myself, God, you are my salvation. Why? Because you're in me now. You're in me now, God. And so she goes and she walks and she starts doing it. And remember how we talked about how she said, uh, that I'm going to be a mother to God or a mother for God, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do what a mother does. I'm going to protect that which is in me when I give birth and when I bear the son that you have given me. You know that we need to have the mentality of that with the Holy Spirit that is inside of you, that you would protect that. You see, I related it to a dream and a vision, but it is so much more than just a dream and a vision. It is the very essence of God living inside of you that you have to protect the very spirit of God inside of you. You have to cultivate and protect because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that the very spirit of God is inside of you and you are no longer your own? You are no longer free to do what you do, did before and what you want to do now because there is something inside of you that is so precious. So precious, just like a baby. You know, when a, when a woman's pregnant, she can't do everything that she used to do. 
because she got something inside of her now. She's got something inside of her now. You got to be real careful and real fat, fragile uh, with, with that person as the more that the baby develops, as the more that you develop, as the more that what God has placed in you now becomes a reality and you start developing the relationship with the Holy Spirit. You got to be fragile. You can't do the things that you used to do. Because wait a minute, I got somebody inside of me now that I've got to protect. The Holy Spirit has some feelings. I don't know if y'all knew that. Yet he, the Bible says that it is, a, it is a he, that he, the Holy Spirit, is a masculine term. But some scholars, and this is going to blow your mind. I read this in the book. I'll, hear, I'll just give you all that. I won't give you the title of the book. I'm known for that. But I read this in a book. Or Miss Catherine said, just say, I heard it said once. And then the more you say it, you just say, I said it. Okay, I'll do that. I heard it said once that scholars actually believe that even though he is a, 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 the spirit is a he that is masculine, though he is the most feminine of the three of the Godhead. Because God is father and mother in one. He is all that he is. There is nothing incomplete without him. So he has a fatherly side and a motherly side. And the Holy Spirit is the motherly side because he gets offended easily. That's not, a, that's not you know, a dig at women. <laughs> but come on. He gets offended easily. And so that is why they believe he's more feminine than actually God the Father, God, Jesus said, you know what, you can curse me all you want, but do not curse. This is what is unforgivable. You can say what you want to me, but don't curse the Holy Spirit. So that's how sensitive he is. And so you have to walk around as a way of a mother and say, you know what, I'm going to guard this that's inside of me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold this precious to my side, and I can't do what I used to do because now I got a new person inside of me, and that is the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to be a mother, and I'm going to be the, inc the incubator of life, and I'm going to be the, 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 the blocking, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deter that which tries to come to harm which is inside of me, and I'm going to stand, and I'm going to do all these things because he is now inside of me. And how many of you know that not only can, can somebody else inflict pain on that which is inside of you, but you can also self-inflict that which is inside of you pain. And so a mother can't do what everybody else can do because they can inflict self-harm to the baby that they have inside of them, which is why you need to go get your prenatal vitamins, which is why you got to go do all these things, making sure you're eating right, making sure you're doing all that which is necessary. That is the same way with the Holy Spirit. You need to make sure that you get your vitamins. You need to make sure that you're eating right, which is this bread right here. You need to make sure that you're doing all that which is necessary to protect that which is inside of you, which is now the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the angel says he will be the God on high. He's going to be all this to all the world in verse 34 the angel answered and said that the holy spirit will come upon you the power of the highest will overshadow you therefore the one the holy one who is born in you shall be called the son of god so what is inside of you not just a dream not just a vision not just a calling not just a purpose but the very spirit of god is what you now have to protect Mary, you now have to protect this, Mary. You now have to do this, Mary. You now have to, you now have to do this, believer. You now have to walk with this, with this all of a sudden awareness that you no longer had. You can't live in reckless abandon. You can't do what you used to do. Because just like Mary was the temple of Jesus, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I get it. Man, I get excited when I think about that too, Pastor Gene, that the God of all creator of all the universe lives inside of me. That he sees me so worthy and so favored and that he likes me enough to be with me all the time. Some of y'all, I like you, but I can't be with you all the time. 
I can't, I can't even be with me all the time. I wish I could get away with me, but I can't. I'm stuck. Imagine that, like, oh, imagine that, like, that's the way the Lord feels about some of us. He said, man, I wish I could get away from you too, but I said, I'm never going to leave you, no forsake you. I'm stuck. God, you need to work on yourself, buddy. Man. And so Mary is the believer walking her way. If you're in here, you say, I don't even know the Lord. Well, you are that person. He's saying, I've chosen you. I've called you from the very foundations of the world. I formed you even before you were in your mother's womb. And I have called you. I have ordained you. I have a plan that looks so much more different than the plan you have for yourself. But I guarantee you, it is so much more better. Even what you can think or imagine, I can go beyond that. If you just let me place myself inside of you, which is a salvation experience. The new believer, the ordinary believer, the believer who comes to Christ, you are them. You are Mary, favored beyond anybody. Why do you keep saying, I don't know why I keep saying, I guess y'all have to start believing that, that you are favored beyond anybody. Like you should walk around with the attitude that I'm favored, that I am God's special, I am God's special child. I am the favorite son. Remember John, when he said, I am the Lord whom the love, whom the Lord loves. I am the guy whom the Lord loves. There you go. You know what I'm talking about. I am the one whom the Lord loves. It wasn't boasting, but it was the revelation that he was so loved beyond that he thought he was God's favorite one. That we would get that revelation. Man. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the dwelling place and the home of the Spirit. For it is a gift of God from God. You got to realize that you got a gift. How many of you know that the more expensive the gift is, the more you have to be careful with? The more like, like, like if you get like a, a, a knockoff watch or something that really costs like 10, 15 bucks, you know, you're just like throwing that thing around, you know, I'm swinging my arms around and everything. But when you get like a watch and you don't get the insurance, so you're like, oh man, I can't, <laughs> I can't. I can't, you better, I better get a screen protector. I better get all this stuff because I didn't get the insurance. I'm a little cheap like that. So if something happens, it's got to come out of my pocket. Well, it is the gift of God that you are the temple, and it is the most expensive gift that was ever paid for and given to you. So you got to walk around and say, well, I, well, 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 there, I, I, don't, I don't know if I got the insurance on this, but I'm going to protect what is inside of me now. We got people walking around. I got insurance. It can be replaced. And they just do whatever they want. Oh, Grace, that's my insurance. I can do whatever I want. So you walk around and say, oh, it's covered. Oh, it's good. Oh, I can do that. Oh, I can do that. I'm going to file the insurance claim. God, forgive me. That's the insurance claim. But he's saying, no, 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 I'll forgive you. But don't treat me like that. I'll forgive you. And the revelation, this wasn't planned, but the revelation, I read this yesterday when I was studying. and, and, And how it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And the New Living Translation says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit in the way that you live your life. And I was like, man, so it's not an incident of grieving the spirit, but it is the way you conduct your life that grieves him. And it didn't make sense to me because I was asked, I said, you know, when, whenever you do something, whenever, whenever you, you sin, how do you feel? And I said, you know what, it's funny that you said that because I did something the other day that I was so ashamed of, and I didn't, I, like, it was like there was shame. Instead of conviction, there was shame, and I, and I waited to talk to the Father about it, and I waited like two days, which was dumb because I was like, man, how can I just give a good message talking about the friendship of who you are, God, and yet I, I, my mind went back to the old way of thinking. 
And he said, you know what? It wasn't the act that you did that grieved me. He said, it was the fact that you waited so long to come to me that grieved me. And I said, what? What do you mean? Like, you weren't upset? He goes, yeah, it hurt. But what hurt me more is the fact that you took two days to come before me. That's what grieved me. That's what hurt me. And I said, oh, my gosh. So he said, you know what? I know you're not perfect. You're getting perfected. So you will mess up. That's not what grieves me. What grieves me is that when your life doesn't reflect who I am, not one particular instance, but your life is not reflecting me. That's what grieves me. And when your life reflects me, then those instances of you hurting me will become lesser and lesser and lesser. But if your life, who you are, doesn't reflect me, then I'm grieved. And it just blew my mind. I don't know why we're saying that. So somebody needed to hear that. But then she says in verse 38, she says, let it be unto me according to your word. She finally gets in line on agreement uh, that, that the spirit of God is going to be deposited in her. And she says, let it be unto me according to your word. All that the Bible says about the spirit that he has in place, that now he has placed his spirit inside of you. You need to come in agreement and say, let it be unto me. All that you offer to me, all that you want to do with me, all that you want to bring out of me. Let it be according to your word. That is the attitude that every believer should have in this building that knows God, that has his spirit. Let it be unto me according to your word. And I believe that that is the prophetic word of the Lord for this year, that if you would allow Jesus to do what he wants to do and you would have that attitude, let it be unto me according to your word. So Mary is the believer. Well, there was two people that were pregnant at this time. There was Mary, and then there was Elizabeth. And remember how we talked about last week that Elizabeth, that everyone around Elizabeth got excited about her when it was her full time. Verse 57, chapter 1, verse 57, now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered and she brought forth a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So Elizabeth is a prime example of a believer as well. But there's a difference between Elizabeth and Mary. And can I show you the difference? I got like six pages of notes, so I might not finish today neither. But go to the very beginning of chapter 1, verse 5. Now it says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. Probably didn't pronounce that right, but go with me. His wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Okay, so we got Zacharias and Elizabeth. This is Elizabeth's account. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in their age or in their years. You see, so this is a description of not somebody who just came to Christ is not somebody who just got called out in the middle of all her plans. This is somebody, Zacharias, was a priest who knew God, 
who did what he was supposed to do so much so that Luke describes them as blameless before the Lord, walking in righteousness with God. But there was one thing, there was something missing in what they were doing. And so he goes, and, 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 and he's living a life pleasing to God the way that he knows how. Actually, they represent two people, but I'm going to let the Lord decide which one we're telling you all today. So he's walking and doing the way that they know how, blameless before God, blameless and righteous before everybody else. And all of a sudden, God sees what they lack. There are some people in here that know God, that are doing, following by the law, but there is something that you lack. You're doing everything right, and you're trying to uphold the law, and you're trying to be righteous, and you're doing it. And Zacharias was even serving the Lord inside church, and we have a lot of people inside the church that serve God, but there is something lacking on the inside. And God says, I see you, Zacharias. Let's continue reading. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in age. So these were not young pups in the kingdom of God. They had been serving God for a long time. They were well advanced in their age, and everybody knew who they were. Everybody knew that they couldn't hold life inside of them. Everybody knew that they couldn't get the very thing that they were trying to attain. Verse 8, so it was that while he was serving, while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. You see, so it was his turn to serve. And he was a priest. He had a lineage of people who knew God. A lineage of people, maybe you've been raised in church, and you had a lineage of family who knew God. And so you've just been doing what you've been doing all along. Because that's what you know. And Zacharias is doing that. It was his time. He's going into the temple to go offer incense to the Lord and sacrifice. Yet, something changed this time. It wasn't like any other time. You say, I've been serving God, but this year isn't like any other time. Something's about to change. Something is about to change. In Zacharias, or it says, verse 11, then the angel of the Lord, what changed? He saw the angel of the Lord. He came into the very presence of God. So you now turned in from routine. It turned from from religion to experience. It turned from religion to an encounter. It turned from just a, 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 an act that I do, just something that I do, trying to please God, to now encountering the very one who is pleased with you. And he has this miraculous encounter. Might I dare say that there are going to be some children of God that have been going about all their lives doing what they've been taught to, but they don't really know God, and he's going to encounter you this year. He is going to interrupt the process. He is going to disrupt all that you've been doing all your life, and you are going to know him in a way that you have never known him before. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Why? Because he has never experienced this. So it's kind of weird. It's kind of different. It's kind of, I don't know what to think about this. You know, the Lord's moving in different ways. I don't really know what to think about this because I'm so used to the way it used to go. But God's now interrupting the way that it used to flow. And so now he's saying, whoa, whoa. I imagine if he was from the hood, he probably like right one of those, like, come on, back up. I, the angels are big. 
And so Zacharias saw him. He was troubled and fear fell upon him. Verse 13, but the angel of the Lord said, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. You see, there are so many people who still do the routine and the tradition and everything, but that is not their heart. He was, he said, you know what, even though I'm doing this and even though it feels the same, everything, I still long for more. Your prayer, Zacharias, has been heard. Even though you've been doing this, even though you've been, been serving me the same way and there hasn't been a relationship, I know the innermost parts of your being and you desire and you long for more. And I've heard you. There's some of y'all who say, man, I always desire and I long for more. I just don't know how. God has heard you. He's heard you. Zacharias, your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John. John means God's gift. That is one of his meanings of the word John. And he says, you know what? I've seen your prayer. I've seen your struggle. I know your heart. I see the intents of what you want to do. And so I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you what you have wanted. And I'm going to place something inside of you that you've never felt before. And I'm going to do something with you that's never been done before. And even though you're so used to doing it the way that you used to do it, I'm going to change you. Why? Because I'm in you now. And I'm going to do it, and it's going to be a gift, just like what I'm doing with Mary. You cannot do what you want because this is the most expensive gift anybody can give. You will name him John. You've been crying out for this, Zacharias. Now you've got to guard it and you've got to protect it because it's a gift. And what I place inside of you, which is the Holy Spirit, and you... Well, verse 14, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Many will rejoice at his birth. You wonder why your old religious traditions have not caused those to, around you to rejoice. Why? Because that's all that it is. It's religion and tradition. But when you have an encounter with God, something will switch in the inside of you, and then everybody around you will see it and rejoice with you. I'm tired of being around dead folk. I know the Bible says that we dead to ourselves, but y'all just dead to everything. <laughs> Can't be dead to everything. You got to be alive under him. We got dead people uh, dead to everything in him. And he said, no, I want to quicken you. I want you to be alive in me that will cause other people to come and rejoice. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And verse 15, and he shall not drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. The believer who's just going on, now he's being filled with the Holy Spirit. But they wanted this. They longed for this. They desired this. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. When God gets inside of you and turns the religion to a relationship, that will be the outcome. You will turn all those that are around you from where they're at, point it to him. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. The power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's such an important verse. You need to highlight that. That what he's placed in Elizabeth and Zachariah's life, they are going to get ready to prepare the people for the Lord. How many of you know that that is your job description? To get a people ready, prepared for the Lord. If we ain't doing that, we shouldn't be doing nothing. And then the story goes on. Zacharias says, you know, well, well, how he doesn't agree with them. And so the angel of the Lord has to shut his 
mouth. I believe that people that are not going to go along with what God's going to do this year, God is going to have to shut their mouth. And we are going to see what he wants to do. And I don't know about y'all, I'm just excited to go along for the ride. So I ain't going to be saying much. I'm going to be like, yeah, all right, you want to do that? Let's do it. Come on. Like you want, oh, 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 I didn't know you want to do that. Let's go. Then we're going to see people like, oh, no, that's not what the Lord wants to do. Well, how do you know? As long as it doesn't go against the word of God. As long, but if it goes against what you feel and how you did it before and everything, I'm going to hold this word and I'm going to ask him to shut your mouth. <laughs> right? Come on now. We got to get bold. He's going to shut the mouths of all those that are going to go against what he wants to do. He's going to shut the mouth of all those. And so he comes out, verse 22, but when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had a vision of the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now we pick it up in verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came. You see, that is so important right there. We got a lot of people not wanting to wait for the full time. We got a lot of people that want to jump the process and want to want to bypass what is what is required to do the full time or the full term. And it says now Elizabeth's full time came and she was Delivered to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. The full time. When I said, Lord, you know what? I don't want to do anything unless it's the full time. Unless it's your timing. Unless what I have that is inside of me is fully developed, and it will make the test of time. It will prevail. It will not be aborted. It will not be miscarried. It will not be uh, anemic. It will not be anything that you can think of when something is premature. But it is the full time, God. And he said, yes, even though they're born and even though it was the full time she delivered. How I mean, you know, when you deliver something in the full term, it isn't just time for you to neglect it. Because, oh, it's delivered. Whenever Jesus comes inside of you and now you've matured and now you've, you, you're coming into your full time and he's called you to go do something and called you to go do something for his kingdom and everything, you have to make sure it is his time. And when you allow it to be birthed inside of you. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says the same way the nursing, this is the Passion Translation. You can read it in, in any translation. I just like the way this is worded because it brings it more into a picture. It says the same way the nursing infants cry for milk. You must intensely crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word in order to be in full time, in order to carry the full term. You need to intensely crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word, for this milk will cause you to grow into maturity fully, the full time, nourished and strong for life. And that's another word for somebody in here, that what God's given you, you got to make sure that you don't go away from the pure spiritual milk of his word because it needs to be fully matured, and you can only be fully matured by this word. No other thing can do it. Worship can't do it. Nothing can do it. You can't go and listen to a TV pastor. You can't go and listen to a pastor that comes up on this stage, but you need to have the pure milk of the word in order to to carry what is inside of you to the full term. The pure milk. And then so she goes and she gives birth. 59 through 61. I'm going to read to you and then we'll start winding it down. 
So it was on the eighth day. This is when I got excited. You might want to take notes if you're not taking notes. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him by the name of his father. They would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. And his mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. This is my gift from God. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who's called by this name. I don't know about you, but I've had people tell me when God's placed something inside of me, not just his spirit, but the call on my life. And they said, you aren't any different than anybody else who has come before you. And they try to label me your daddy dealt with this, you're going to deal with this. You've dealt with this throughout your whole family line. And so what makes you any different? This is what they're trying to do to Elizabeth. What makes him any different? We are going to name him just like the way that his father was. He's going to walk in a routine. He's going to serve God this way. He's going to be just like them. And she says, no, it stops with us today. Don't try to put me in a box by all those who came before me. Don't try to place what God has given inside of me the same way because because you experienced that does not mean that I will experience that. I have people tell me that. Oh, you're just too zealous. You know what? That's good. That's good. That's good. But what makes you any different? You're just going to be like everybody else. And they're trying to do this to John. When he was born on the eighth day, hadn't even really fully come to comprehension. Isn't it amazing that they tried to label him right when it was birthed? That's why you got to guard and protect. Because people will try to label you through what they've experienced, forgetting that I'm favored. Forgetting that I am seen by him. Forgetting that he has his eye on me. I'm sorry you experienced that, but that's not me. And so they go so much to go get the daddy to try to get him in agreement. No, right? Ain't your son supposed to be named Zacharias? This is why he wasn't able to talk. Because he would have agreed with them too. He would have labeled him, John, in the very beginning stages of what God wants to do by his own experience. And said, yes, that's my boy, Zacharias. He's my junior. He's going to do what I do. Only God don't want him to do what you do. And he says, Wait, 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 let's go to the daddy. I had my whole family bloodline dealing with something, their entire line. Even even the people that weren't even in my bloodline, they were just around me. Dealing with things of the flesh and having generational curse coming on from generation to generation and people trying to label me you're just going to be just like them and God says no you're not you're not going to be like them you're not going to be like them quit letting the generational curse carry on from this generation it breaks but you got to come into agreement people got got sicknesses and diseases going on through their through their bloodline and you've said well they got it I'm gonna get it stop he's given you a gift that is the gift of his son the gift of salvation the gift of a new bloodline well let's go to the dad and the dad can't talk Verse 62, so they made signs. 
verse, first, uh, first Peter 2, 9. Let's read that. That was important. I don't know why I got that on there, but we'll read that. Is that up on the screen? But you are a chosen generation. That's why I wrote it down. Okay. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. He's, you're his people. You're not your family's people anymore. You are chosen. What you've dealt with and what your family has dealt with, what you have been dealing with is no longer an issue because now you are his. You're his special people, a chosen generation, so that you will proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, out of that situation, out of that family curse, out of that generational curse. He has called you out of that and now has placed you in his family, in his light. So don't let them, How da- you, your attitude should be, how dare you try to label me that? How dare you try to put that on me just because you dealt with it? How dare you? And so Zacharias, he can't talk, and yet he goes and he says, no, no, I'm, I, 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 what? They didn't have sign language back then. This is probably where they started thinking, we need sign language. <laughs> this is probably where it came about. And so they said, go get him a tablet. He goes and gets a tablet. And then... He writes on the tablet, verse 63. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, I'm not going to label him what I've experienced. I'm not going to box him in to what I know. I'm not going to allow anything to go beyond my bloodline anymore. I'm going to stop it, and I'm going to name him what God has called him, John. He is a gift of God. So they all marveled. They all marveled. Not the fact that he wrote his name down. Why would they marvel about that? I truly believe that they marveled because something broke at that moment. Something switched at that moment. They didn't marvel because he was able to write. They already knew he couldn't talk. So the only way they could communicate with him was through writing. So that is not what caused them to marvel. What caused them to marvel that he broke the mold. He broke the line. He broke everything that they had experienced to this far and says, now we are going to start something new. And they caused, it caused them all to marvel. He says, they marvel, and immediately when he gets in line with the word of God and he decides to call the situation what God calls the situation, then his mouth opens. Then his mouth opens. Why? Because I got to get you to believe it so much so that if I got to shut you up, you can cause what I meant for good and you can turn it back around to your old ways. So I got to get you to believe it. And when you decide to believe what I said, then we can get started. But notice that. You know what causes him? Do you know why he marveled? Do you know why he got in line? Do you know why he wrote it down? Because my Bible says in Habakkuk 2, 2, it says to write the vision down. Isn't that what it says? And what did, what did Zacharias do? He wrote what God said down on a tablet. And so he must have been thinking about this. God, you've given me a vision. You know what? I can't just get an agreement with it because I know, but everybody else needs to see what you're going to do. So I got to write it down. That's why they marveled, because he wrote the vision down. The Bible says, Write the vision. And in another translation, it says, write my answer down. What God sees, what he says, and make it plain on what tablets? What did he write it on? On a tablet that he may run who reads it. Not only did he get an agreement with what God said, but he wrote it down. This is the gift of God, the gift that God has given me, and I'm not going to go back to where I used to be. I'm not going to go back 
There's no more going back. No more going back. And I want to encourage you today that if you would allow God to speak inside of you, and if you can get an agreement with what he's saying, remember, this was the believer that already knew God. Righteous before God, blameless in all their ways, was a priest serving God and everything, but he had to change something inside of that believer too. He had to do something inside Zacharias and Elizabeth. Mary didn't know really much about anything, so it was easy. She just said, oh, Lord, be your way. Didn't have anything to complain or compare to, so Mary didn't have to be shut up. Zacharias had to be shut up because he was comparing his past experience. You get that? Quit comparing. Quit complaining. Shut up. Let God do what he want to do. Write it down. After he got in line, he wrote it down, and immediately his mouth was open. Now I see, Zacharias, you're not going to be complaining, comparing. You're not going to be griping or or anything like that, so I'm going to open up your mouth. And immediately his mouth was open, and what was the first thing he did? He spoke praising God. Verse 65, then fear came all who dwelt among them, and all the sayings were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, what kind of child will this be? What kind of child will this be? Man, look at everything that has surrounded his birth. Look at everything that has happened. Look at all the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. Man, we can't even imagine what's going to come next. Man, we can't even fathom what kind of child can this be. And it all just was obedience through Zacharias and Elizabeth. And them asking God, I want a, I want a deeper relationship. I want a deeper encounter of who you are, God. I want this. I've been longing for this. I've been longing for this, God. And he says, you know what? I see your prayer. I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you, John, God's gift. I'm going to gift this to you. It is a gift because you've been asking. We've got a lot of people who haven't been asking for God's gift. we got a lot of people who haven't been saying, God, I want to do this. They just think this in their minds. And God says, you know what? No, no, no. you got to speak it out you got to speak it out. And when you do this, it's going to cause everybody around you to wonder, oh, my gosh, what is God doing with them? How amazing is this going to be? I can't even understand or fathom what's happening right now. Imagine when everything, he was only eight days old when this happened. It was, very, it was the very beginning of John's birth, and everybody was already astonished. And I'm going to end with this, verse 66, all those that kept them in their hearts saying, what kind of man will this be? It says, the way that scripture ends, it says, and the hand of the Lord was with him. The hand of the Lord was with him. There are a lot of people who think, well, you know, God... God said this, God said that, but fear comes. And you say, well, I want, I want to step out. I want to do this. I want to do that. But how is it going to be done? Well, the Bible says the hand of the Lord was with him. Didn't say his face. Didn't say his heart. Well, we know that the face and the heart of God was with him because it was his plan and his purpose. But it specifically says his hand which represents his provision, his authority, and his power. That the hand of God was with them. They didn't have to worry about, go ahead, brother, keep playing. They didn't have to worry about, we're winding it down. We didn't have to worry about how he was going to provide 
We didn't have to worry about what authority I'm going to walk into. We didn't have to worry about the power. We didn't have to worry about that. We got so many people worrying about if God says this or he does this. What else is going to happen? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? No, his hand will be with you. His authority, his provision, and his power will be with you. Stand to your feet. Good, I'm cutting it short. So hopefully, I'm, amen. We got playoff games. <laughs> yeah. His hand will be with you. His provision, his authority, and his power will be with you, the hand of God. So it represents two people. So I want to speak to those two people today. One who says, I don't really know God. I don't know him. I don't know what you're really talking about. But I do feel this tugging. I do feel this, this drawing to what you're talking about. That is God choosing you, saying, I want you. Saying, I've called you, I've formed you, I've fashioned you. I want to have an encounter with you. I want to place myself inside of you by my spirit. So with every head bowed and every eye closed. You say, I want to experience that encounter with God. And say, I want to experience that that causes my life to turn around. It is called the, the born again experience, coming to salvation to Jesus. That is the, the experience that Mary had, walking in her own plans and her own ways, and then God interrupts your life and then places himself in your life. And then eventually he becomes your life. After Mary was impregnated with Jesus, she didn't just stop having him in her life. That was still her life. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. It wasn't just a, we, we equate salvation to just a one-time prayer and that's it. That's, that's more than that. And so you say, I want to I wanna experience that. It's called being born again. The Bible says that, that God will actually come and Jesus will be your Lord and he will be your Savior and he will, he will have a spot for you in heaven and, and he will forgive you and he will, he will do all of these things, but it all starts with you inviting him into your life. And so you say, I've never done that before. I want to give you the opportunity. I want to pray with you. This is the first person I want to pray with you. You say, I want to experience salvation. If you would be so bold with every head bowed and every eye closed to lift up your hand, and we will pray with you to have this encounter with Jesus. The second person would be the Zacharias. Would be the person that... He represents two people. He represents somebody who, who wants to go deeper and somebody who wants to have an encounter and somebody who wants to know God on a different level. And then there's somebody who's doing all that they can the right way to know God. And then there's somebody who's just got that old form of religion. This is just tradition. This is just something that I do. And God wants to speak to both of you right now. He says, I, I, I see your hunger, I see your desire, I see your thirst. In my word, I said those who hunger and thirst will be filled. I want to fill you today. And you say, well, you know what? I'm tired of this old way of tradition. I'm tired of this old way of religion. I'm tired of this, of this way that I've been doing things. Something needs to change. It all comes with you asking. Zacharias, I've seen you, I heard your prayer. I've seen you and I heard your prayer. Something's about to change. So if you're one of those two people, I want to say, lift up your hand and we will pray with you. Amen. I see about four or five hands. If you could come up here to the front so that we can pray with you, you can put on a mask, I'll put on mine. As the praise and worship team, Go ahead and continue. We are going to pray with these.
group of people, and I want you guys not to just be watching or staring or anything. I want you to enter in and pray, and let's have uh, a, a Holy Ghost moment right now. Guys, this is a serious moment. You can worship, and uh, then we'll go on from there. Amen. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow.
give him praise, church. Give him praise. How many of y'all receive the word of the Lord today? Amen. Well, let's close. We'll dismiss in prayer. You bow your heads with me, and people are still being ministered to. Just, just allow that to go forth. Right now, God, I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in, our, in your church, not in Cornerstone Church, but your church, God, what you're doing out throughout the world, Father. I thank you for the move of your spirit like we've never seen before. I thank you for revelations like we've never seen before. I thank you for signs, wonders, and miracles like we've never seen before. God, I praise you that your people are coming up, and they are coming up hungry, Father, that you have a remnant, God, that there is never nothing that you can't handle. There is never nothing that you have not seen before, Father, and I thank Thank you. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your move. I thank you for your comfort. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your guidance. I thank you for all that you're going to do this year, for all that you've already started to do. I thank you, Father, for your love. Most of all, that you love us and that we are your sons and daughters. We give you honor. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. Amen, guys. Well, don't forget Wednesday nights. Join us online as we have Pastor Robbie uh, doing Wednesday night to, uh, this coming Wednesday. We'll see y'all. Have a good day. Oh, the blood of Jesus.